I've been getting a lot of questions around the S&P 500, if I believe it's undervalued, if it's overvalued, and just update you on my valuation in general for the S&P and my macro outlook, as I don't do these videos very often. Many of you have been asking me about these videos, so I decided to do one here on uh, Sunday, and I'm gonna explain something to you that I learned the hard way that most people have not even figured out. I mean, some people know this, but a lot of people still believe that if the stock market is overvalued, that means the stock market is gonna crash. And the stock market doesn't work this way. It used to work this way before 2008, but after 2008, something happened and everything has changed. The stock market has changed forever. And I'm gonna talk about all of that here in the video. Now, if you just look at a basic S&P 500 PE ratio, is sitting at 26 times earnings, which is higher than historical average. So on a basic P-E ratio, it does look a little bit overvalued. If you look at a forward P-E ratio, at a forward P-E ratio, it's trading you know, lower than it was in 2021 when we had 0% interest rates, but it's still much higher than the historical average. And if you compare it to the United the pretty much the world, excluding the US, which is in the blue, you can see that the rest of the world is much better priced than the United States, especially Canada and the UK. This is when I've been looking for or some stock potential investments and stuff. I've been finding a lot of value over there. So even on a forward PE ratio, on a historical basis compared to other countries, the United States stock market still looks somewhat overvalued, even though the United States is growing much faster in terms of EPS than the rest of the world, it still somewhat looks overvalued. Now, if you look at the S&P 500's chart since 2009, it's been a crazy run. And a lot of you could look at that and you could look at the high valuation for the S&P and you would determine that we'll likely have a stock market crash because the stocks are too high and the S&P 500 is overvalued. And this is something that I've learned the hard way. And I lost money a little bit, this is how I learned it. But if you remember, since 2009, there were many people that went on TV every single year and they called for a stock market crash because stocks were overvalued and we can't, can't keep going on forever. From 2009 to 2023, every single year, someone is going to call for a stock market crash. And the main reason is stocks are overvalued. And something that I learned is that stocks being overvalued is not enough for a reason for the market to crash because stocks can keep getting overvalued for the next 10 years, for the next 15 or 20 years. We can have a 20 year run where stocks keep getting more and more overvalued, more and more overvalued every single year without us having a major stock market crash. And whenever we have a stock market crash, there's normally a catalyst that triggers this crash. So the reason I was bearish in 2021 is not only because stocks were overvalued, but I saw a way where the bubble could prick, where stocks could become less overvalued, and this is by the start of the tightening cycle. The tightening cycle hasn't started yet, and I looked at a historical you know, data, and I saw that whenever the Fed is hiking rates, you know, valuations contract as interest rates go up, and then stocks go from being overvalued to fairly valued, close to undervalued. So this is why I was bearish in 2021. Now, a lot of people ask me, do you think we're going to have a crash in 2024? just because stocks are overvalued or just because we're sitting close to all-time high? And the answer is no, this is not a reason for me to call for a crash. I have to see how is the stock market going to crash? What is going to change the perception of investors and make them want to sell stocks? And for me personally, I am not seeing a clear catalyst that would cause a massive market crash, but I'm seeing the exact opposite. And I'm going to tell you what it is here in the video. Now, this is something that might upset some of you, and this is that valuations don't matter. Now, if I say, what do you mean? You make all these videos on valuations, valuing stocks, this is undervalued, this is overvalued. What do you mean valuations don't matter? Well, after 2008, we had something called quantitative easing. And since that happened, and whenever the balance sheet has expanded in the orange, the S&P has rallied. Whenever the, the balance sheet has pretty much been flat or contracted a little bit, the S&P also somewhat rallied, but it struggled to rally. For example, we stayed flat from 2015 to 2017, then we rallied a little bit, and then after the balance sheet started contracting in 2018, we had two crashes. We had the late 2018 crash, and we had the COVID crash, which maybe has nothing to do with it. But we stayed flat from 2018 to pretty much early 2020. So this is flat for another two years. Then we had a massive expansion of the balance sheet after COVID. And once that happened, the, the S&P 500 expanded. And then we had the balance sheet contract. And then the S&P went down in 2022. So this would tell me the evaluations, of course, matter. They matter with individual stocks. But once we're talking about the S&P in general, valuations don't dictate 
if the SAP is gonna go be up or down, if it's gonna crash or if it's gonna rally. If it's overvalued, it can get more overvalued. If it's undervalued, it can get more over undervalued. This is not enough for us to make a thesis. And it's mainly moved by liquidity. And for me, looking into the future, I see liquidity expanding, which means the S&P could potentially keep on rallying or it could stay flat until these stocks grow into the valuation. The only thing that could mess up this thesis as if inflation does pick up in a major way, and if it stays consistent. It did pick up in December in terms of the CPI. PPI contracted, it looked great, but CPI months over months did expand. Now, if this is not a one-off and it keeps happening in January, February, March, April, then we have a problem, and that would mean that the Fed is not gonna make those three rate cuts in 2024, the market is pricing in six rate cuts in 2024. You could see what the Fed is trying to do. This is one, two, three rate cuts, but the market is pricing in around six rate cuts. And if we do have a higher CPI, it keeps going up, then the market is going to be extremely disappointed because they priced in six rate cuts and we might not have any rate cut. So this would be the only way where I see a contraction in liquidity continuing in general for the market. And I could see the market you know, being set up for a massive disappointment. But I believe that the CPI in December was a one-off and January, February, I got to look a little bit better. This is just what I believe in. Now, something else we have to know and something that the Fed told us is whenever we had the SVB stuff, the SVB crash, if you remember, Silicon Valley Bank, and whenever we had this crash, a lot of people said that the Fed will not save it because we have higher inflation. We had like 6.5% inflation. The Fed still expanded the balance sheet. So this would tell us that even if we have 10 or 15% inflation, or no matter what's happening, the Fed is always going to come to the rescue. And this is the whole thesis that the Fed is trapped and they can't uh, cut rates, they can't mess up the balance sheet because we have high inflation is wrong. The Fed is going to jump in and save the economy, save the markets if something bad happens. And I know this is not what we want. Maybe this is not what you want. Maybe you want something a little bit more fair. You want free markets and all these things. But this is not reality. And I saw, just like you did, that maybe the Fed is not going to be able to do anything because we have high inflation. This means the stock market is going to crash in a major way. But they showed us the exact opposite in SVB. And everyone called for the next 2008. Whenever the Fed did intervene, we had the NASDAQ. It's been up huge since then. We had a buying opportunity on CrowdStrike, which I bought, and then I sold it a little bit later. I mean, it was a dumb move from me. But I did buy a lot on the SVB dip because the Fed did intervene. And I understood from losing money before that the market doesn't move on valuations. It moves on liquidity. And once liquidity comes in, even though it looks very bad, the market's going to look way past it and the S&P is going to go up. <laughs> and this is just the way it's been working since 2008. Now, another source of liquidity that a lot of people are not talking about is mainly the money market funds. We have record inflows into money market funds, over $6 trillion. They're collecting maybe 5 to 5.5%. 5 now, if we do have lower interest rates closer to 3% or 3.5% in the future, this money has to go somewhere. I don't personally believe it's going to stay in money market funds, and I don't think it's going to go to bonds. Bonds yields have been coming down, and they will likely come down more in the future. The only place it could go is S&P 500. So this is another source of liquidity, over $6 trillion, that most people are not talking about. Whenever we have lower interest rates, you're going to have more and more inflows into the S&P 500. Now, looking at one thing that's a little bit concerning, which not a lot of people are talking about, and this is mainly the yield curve, which is the 10-year minus the two-year. It tends to predict recessions, and you mainly have to worry after it turns positive and it reinverts. Every single time, we pretty much reinvert it. After a few months, I believe it was 10 or 12 months, we had a <laughs> massive recession and the S&P crashed. The same thing happened in 2001. Nothing happened after it went negative. As soon as it went positive, every few months, we had the recession in the gray shaded area. The same thing happened in 2000, and the same thing happened, I mean, maybe you, could, maybe you don't have to count March 2020, maybe it was because of COVID, but we're about to reinvert here very, very soon. It's, it started to get pretty close to positive, which means we have to start asking ourselves, you know, should we be prepared for something bad to happen? Are we going to have another recession? Or is this time different? Because we have a lot of things that have never happened. A lot of the ways the Fed is doing a lot of things. It has never happened before. The Magnificent Seven, massive outperformance. 
It hasn't happened very often. Now the S is a magnificent seven. They make four times the Russell 2000's market cap. I mean, this is huge. And this is why I've been looking into the Russell 2000 for value. But a lot of things could happen. And I can't really predict what could happen in the video. But from me looking at the data and looking at everything I know and everything I've seen and the way I lost money before, trying to short stocks because they were overvalued without asking myself, what is exactly going to crash these stocks? What is exactly going to crash the S&P 500? And if I can't tell what's going to crash the S&P 500, then it's most likely that the S&P is not going to crash. We can stay flat until these stocks grow into the overvaluations they are in, and then we become fairly valued, or they can rally a little bit more. Unless it's a black swan event, and this is not something I would bet on, I would not sell my portfolio, betting on a black swan event that I can't even know and I can't even see and it might never happen. So this is my opinion on the S&P's valuation. Yes, it does look overvalued. It's not cheap at all. I'm struggling to find value among large cap stocks. This is why I'm looking in Canada. I shared one stock in Canada in my dividend stock video. If you're just interested in watching it, this is the link if you want to watch it. And it's, it's been hard to find value, but that doesn't mean that the market is going to crash unless you know exactly what's going to cause the market to crash. I would not be betting on a stock market crash scenario going into an election. And this was just my honest opinion on the market. It was not financial advice, of course. Thank you for watching the video. I really hope you enjoyed it. So if you did, please press the like button and maybe consider subscribing. So I hope to see you in another video.